Okay, just uh, make a small presentation. Good afternoon, all. I've been talking to you already with Professor Toshihiro Minohara. I'm Colonel Albert Mernier, advisor at the National Defense Institute. And on behalf of the directors of the Institute, Dr. Elena Carreras, I would like to welcome all participants in this conference that we have organized in partnership with the Autonomous University of, Spe of Lisbon. I want to give a special word for Professor Toshihiro Minohara from Kobe University, uh, Japan, whom I thank for the participation in this conference, whose team could not be more actual. Uh, as I used to say, in these peculiar times of COVID, uh, we have to know how to reinvent ourselves and to adapt to this new reality. And I think these conferences that we do with uh, Autonomous University are a good example of what we can do uh, to, uh, to deal with this new reality. Uh, so I don't want to take you longer, so I wish you a fruitful conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colonel Marinheiro. On behalf of Observare, Observatory of Foreign Relations of Autonomy University of Lisbon, and also the National Defense Institute, the two co-organizing institutions of this webinar cycle on China and Asia Pacific, let me begin by welcoming and thanking our distinguished guest from Japan, Professor Professor Tosh Minohara, whom I will introduce in a moment. I'd also like to welcome our students and all the participants in this open class, and thank you for your understanding to keep the videos and audios off to see and hear Professor Tosh Minohara in the best condition. Notice that this open class is being recorded and that the recording will then be made available on the Observare and IDN website as well on the WOWS International Relations YouTube channel. This conference is associated with the Advanced Course on Asia Pacific, promoted in partnership between WOW and IDN, and is part of a vast cycle of conferences that started last May 6. Today, besides this open class with Professor Tosh Minoara, we'll have other talks with Professor Maria Raquel Freire on Russia's Asian policy, Vasco Rato, China and the US, the new global confrontation, and Leonidio Ferreira about the miracle of democracy and prosperity in South Korea under the threat of the Kim dynasty. Within a week, on July 1st, there will be the last day of this webinar cycle with a conference on China and Portuguese speaking countries with five Portuguese speakers, including from the University of Macau and an open class of mine on the China factor in the new world order. But without waiting, waiting any longer, I'm now introducing Professor Tosh Minoara, whom I once again thank the honor of being available to share his many insights and perspectives with us. Tosh Minoara is Professor of International Relations and Security Studies at the Graduate School of Law and Politics, Kobe University, Japan, where he also holds a joint appointment with the Graduate School of International Cooperation Studies. He received his BA in International Relations from the University of California, Davis, and his Master and PhD in Political Science and Diplomatic History from Kobe University. He is also the Chairman and the Executive Director for the nonprofit organization Research Institute of Indo-Pacific Affairs, REIPA, and in addition, he serves as the senior advisor to CREAV based in Stockholm. In the past, he has held various visiting appointments with such universities as Harvard University, University of California at Irvine, University of Iowa, Noguchi Distinguished Fellow, University of Oxford, Leiden University, Stockholm University, Kuwait University, Seoul National University, Inya University of Republic of Korea, National Taipei University, Academia Sinica in Taiwan, and most recently, Mexico Autonomous Institute of Technology, Itam Yoshida Shigeru Share. His chief academic interests lie in the diplomatic, political, intelligence, and security dimensions of US-Japan relations from the early 19th century to the present. 
He has published numerous monographs and articles, the most recent being Behind Versailles, the 1919 moment in East Asia, published by Lexington, Lexington Press, uh, still forthcoming. He is the recipient of the Shimizu Hiroshi Prize and the Japan Research Prize. Dear Tosh, Professor Tosh Minoara, we look forward to your lecture on Kuovadi's post-COVID world, the Sino-US rivalry, and the Japan role. So please, the stage is yours. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tome, for uh, the introduction. Uh, I recall fondly of my visit many years back when you uh, invited me as the McKinder Chair. Uh, it was a pleasure to spend time with you and your colleagues at your university. Uh, Colonel, thanks again for all the arrangements. It's a pleasure to work with those in the military. Uh, today, I've been tasked to talk about the post-COVID uh, world. Uh, perhaps it's too early to say that it's post, but yet I do uh, see that we will uh, eventually pull out uh, from the current uh, situation. Uh, I realize that it's it's noon, uh, or approximately noon, uh, in Portugal, and so uh, hopefully this will, and I know you guys have a late lunch, so hopefully this will, uh, will increase your appetite once I'm finished. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to jump in. Um, can you all see my PowerPoint here? Yes. Okay, excellent, all right. Okay, so let me just jump right in. And of course, the standard caveat applies, and that is that I only represent, you know, what I say, I just represent myself and, and, and nobody else. Uh, and with that, uh, hold on, let me, uh, what is happening here? Okay, let me see. All right. Hold on, sorry, PowerPoint's not, why is it not responding? Okay, so, so for some reason my keyboard is not responding, but I'll just go with what I have here. Okay, so um, China's hegemonic challenge in America. I think this, this pandemic has given us clarity as to uh, the nature of international politics. And that is, well, personally, I, I, I never thought that the, the, the uh, challenge of China was never... Uh, ambiguous, uh, yet I think now the general public sees uh, the, the upcoming rivalry between China and the United States. Let me first talk about China, and this is going to be very brief because of, of the time limitations, of Chinese ambitions. In this case, I have to write his because it's also Xi Jinping's ambitions. And the aspirations are at this point quite unambivalent. And I go to many international conferences, I, I meet many people from China, including the military, and their attitude, uh, the prevailing attitude is quite clear, and that is that they have become a great power. And as such, they will act as a great power, and they expect, and they expect to be treated as a great power as well. And of course, there are many definitions of great power, of course, military power, economic power, but I think one very important concept of becoming a great power is that you are able to redefine the rules so that they uh, suit your national interest. Now, all major powers, great powers in the past have done that, including going back to the days of Spain, Britain, even the United States uh, created rules, a set of rules in which it could seek its own uh, national interest. And so it makes sense. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, defend China, but I'm trying to rationalize Chinese uh, action. So it makes sense that it wants to go ahead and change the world is not as a great power. And so with this, the Chinese also expect countries to accommodate China's rise. Now, initially, when China was uh, a lot more restrained, uh, it, would, it would call itself the peaceful rise. And interesting how the Chinese no longer refer themselves as a peaceful riser. Uh, interestingly, uh, during the People's Congress a couple weeks ago, uh, the term peaceful, uh, you know, uh, integration with Taiwan, the, the word peaceful was also uh, dropped. So you know, I think Chinese intentions have become quite clear. Now, this recent uh, pandemic 
this is my second point here, had opened a tremendous window of opportunity as the United States response to the pandemic was abysmal in my mind. And the United States not only failed to lead a concerted global response, right? Um, it wasn't like the Ebola outbreak in 2014 when the Americans were, were, were at the vanguard of, of, of global action. Uh, this time it was, you know, it underestimated uh, the disease itself and in the end could not safeguard its own citizens. I was watching the news this morning, this is the US news, um, some states are seeing upwards of 5,000, uh, you know, uh, people are being infected uh, each day. And that, that's a tremendous number there. And so uh, President Trump, he, 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 you know, gave the Pearl Harbor analogy. But I think that as a historian, I think that analogy is a lot more appropriate than most people assume. And that is because, I mean, Pearl Harbor was not a surprise per se. I mean, the Americans knew that the Japanese were going to strike. It was just a matter of when the Japanese will strike and where. And so in the same way, I think the pandemic, I mean, we knew that it would eventually arrive in the United States, but the United States failed to prepare. So in that, so in that regard, it definitely is a, a Pearl Harbor. And because of this, Chinese also see this as an important, you know, a, a, an opportunity to, to promote the superiority of the Chinese system. You know, liberalism, democracies are weak. And you see this in the, uh, the uh, warrior, uh, the wolf warrior nationalism, as I call it. You know, it's a little bit of chest thumping. Uh, the Chinese, you know, are, they feel very good about themselves at this moment. Of course, I don't have this written here, but of course, the pandemic also affected the United States naval presence in the Pacific. The Chinese were very quick to take advantage of that, and they actually uh, pushed out their uh, carrier fleet uh, to the Pacific for training missions. Chinese are very active now, uh, even close to Japanese waters. Uh, just yesterday, the Chinese again uh, entered Japanese territorial waters. So uh, the Chinese are uh, very, very aggressive uh, in, in their actions. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the concept of FIFO, and that is first in, first out. Of course, it's an accounting term, but I think it easily, uh, quite adroitly, uh, can describe what's happening in China. That is, it was the first to be uh, be affected by the pandemic, and therefore it's the first to pull out. And so now China sees itself as being uh, sort of an answer to companies that need to uh, restart their economies. You know, it's uh, it's very tantalizing, and it's an easy way out for many companies to rely on China again. And this, of course, is true for for Japan in the sense of not only goods, but also people, the inbound of tourists is a critical component of Japan's economy. This is where <clears throat> perhaps there will be a lot of debate among Sinologists, but I personally don't think that China is creating to, uh, seeking to create a new Sinocentric world order, a Pax Sinica as such, at least not at this moment, perhaps as it becomes more confident and it perceives American weakness as an opportunity, perhaps this could change. But at this point, I believe that China wants to establish a sphere of influence that is free from U.S. interference. So it's a G2-like situation. Or like the Jap when the Japanese challenged the uh, Anglo-U.S. order in the 1930s, the Japanese call it, called it the Asian Monroe Doctrine. So even though the Chinese are not using the term as such, I think it's an Asian Monroe Doctrine redux. It wants an area in which the United States will not get involved in. And this race for influence will be global. It will not be limited to Asia. Africa will also be a place where China wants to expand its influence. And of course, Europe. We already see what's happening with countries like Serbia, uh, <laughs> Hungary, uh, you know, and of course, uh, Portugal. When I was in Portugal several years ago, um, I realized that the Confucius Institute had a very prominent role in, in promoting its propaganda. And, and this was part of China's diplomacy. Then what do we saw, see on the United States? Uh, well, because of Donald Trump's mishandling of the COVID crisis, he need, now he needs a scapegoat because for him, winning in this election, this upcoming election is more important, is, is important or none. And of course, for Trump, Obama and the Democrats are usually the scapegoats. I mean, they lay the blame on them, but now he has this China and also this pandemic, which he refers to as the Kung flu. And this is a great tool because if you, scapegoat the uh, Democrats, then, you know, there are supporters of the Democratic Party. So, you know, you know it's not one monolithic black block. But if you blame it 
on the Chinese, this is this is a bipartisan issue. And the, and the United States public opinion is now staunchly anti-China. I mean, just recent polls shows that 77% of Americans view China as a potential threat. So this is a great political tool to utilize. We will also see further proxy struggles within international institutions. WHO is the most prominent uh, example of this, which will further exaggerate tensions as um, the United States uh, will see con concrete concessions. And Americans want the Chinese to back down. But of course, Xi Jinping cannot do that because he too plays a two-level game. He needs to be aware or to satis satisfy uh, his own people. And it's, and it's keep in mind that um, presidents, when they lose an election and they, they live their, you know, their, their, their happy lives thereafter, hopefully that'll apply for Trump as well. But, you know, for a dictator, that's not necessarily so. I mean, what can happen after you've fallen from power is, is, is usually not a, a, a happy story. And therefore, a weak dic the term weak dictator is an oxymoron. Uh, Xi Jinping needs to be strong, and therefore he needs to uh, do these aggressive power plays. Now, right now, we're seeing the United States tearing apart um, past legacies of Cold War disarmament frameworks, such as the INF, and the New START, you had the open skies. This is because the United States is adjusting to the new reality, that it, it's no longer about Russia. I mean, Russia is, is still a formidable power, but nevertheless, and economically, it's nothing compared to China. Uh, it has energies, so it's a one horse country. And so the greater threat is definitely China. And so Americans realize this, uh, this reality, and therefore it wants China to come into the framework as well, which China most likely will not. Therefore, if these Cold War legacies are being uh, restructured, then NATO will most likely be restructured as well. NATO was, of course, a, you know, an anti-Soviet uh, military alliance. But if your number one enemy is no longer Russia, then I think it's only natural to expect changes to take place within NATO. Uh, and of course, the United States is, I believe, no pushover. Um, it's usually slow to act, but um, when its hegemony is threatened, I believe the United States will push back on all fronts. And so um, phase one, in my mind, will definitely falter, and this US-China decoupling will gain momentum. Okay, and so where, Will this clash take place? And this, no, and this clash is over, over a clash over dominance. And I think I see three pillars to this. Uh, one is the dominance over trade, and this was the most noticeable. But this was also the one in which some kind of concession or compromise could have been made. And Trump was initially very eager to come to some sort of agreement on trade. Now, trade dominance, I believe, is important because it allows you to gain wealth. Um, we, we've seen this with, um, you know, I, I call it the Pax Espana, the first great hegemony, uh, uh, the global hegemony. Uh, Britain also dominated in trade, which led to its wealth. The United States also dominated in trade in the post-World War. Uh, the United States does not want the Chinese to, to dominate in this area. And it's because, then you go to the next tier, once you dominate in trade and you create this vast wealth, what do you do? Well, you invest in technology. And technology right now is, is the forefront. The fact that we're, you know, zooming each other right here, this is technology. And of course, uh, it's the, um, you know, not just the, um, you know, it's AI, it's all, it's all the stuff that, uh, and telecommunication technology, that, that is important because whoever controls technology will gain an upper hand, will be the dominant power. The United States does not want to, to back up or back away and allow China to dominate. And finally, I think it's the geopolitical uh, clash over dominance. Now, I use the word clash, it doesn't mean that they're going to actually collide. It's more of a, a rivalry, which could lead to a clash. And I think we now see, you know, definitely uh, the technology side with uh, American sanctions against Huawei and other Chinese companies have come to the forefront. So we see that now. And what remains to be seen is, a, you know, a geopolitical uh, clash of sorts, which is probably the next phase. 
Now, I talk about hegemonic shift, and of course, um, the shift is not, the, the shifts don't always take place. It could, it could end up as a, a challenge, which fails. But I think that it's, it's safe to conclude that uh, international politics never remains static. It may appear as though it's static because, you know, because nation states, the, the life of hegemons in nations generally are much longer than our biological lives. But when you look at past history, you see the global tectonics taking place. I think right now, uh, in 2020, uh, the movement of not continental plates, but of these major powers, especially the United States and China, will become much more noticeable. Now, the three types, and there are, of course, many subtypes, but the main ones here are, are first outright challenge. And the good example is uh, Japan, Germany, and Italy uh, during the 1930s challenging the Anglo-US order. Uh, fortunately, they did not succeed, but this challenge definitely brought about huge repercussions, not only in Europe, but also in the Asia Pacific. The other, I think, type of hegemonic shift is the hand in hand, which uh, there aren't many examples of this, but the best example that I can think of is the United States and the British uh, working together from 1917. So, you know, Pax Britannica ends uh, with the outbreak of War I, uh, but you have the U.S. as the up-and-coming power, but the United States and Britain worked together until August 1945 and maintained the global order. Post-45, then America wanted to be the sole uh, hegemon. Of course, the Soviet Union was there as a challenger, but the 1917-1945, I think, is a very unique uh, period in history because the the global tectonic shift, the hegemonic shift between from Pax, Pax Britannica to Pax Americana was done peacefully. And this was because the United States and Britain both shared values, right? They were shared values. Unfortunately, I think this example does not apply to China because the United States and the Chinese do not share values. The third, uh, I think, type is the third party, and that is uh, the two hegemon. The, the you know it's the this example is um, Athens and Sparta, but there are many examples on the, the period of uh, the, the three warring nations in China. I mean, there are many examples of of this even in Japanese history, where you have two dominant hegemons, two powers, they fight it out, and in the end they weaken each other so much that a third party comes in and takes over. Right, like the Greeks were then taken over by the Romans. Again, uh, there is no third party in, in the world that we live in today. Um, if there's a U.S.-Chinese uh, rivalry, I don't see Russia coming in to be the ultimate winner. So in this case, I think it, it goes back to the uh, 1930s model where there's an outright challenge. And I think this is what we will uh, see in, in the coming decade. Uh, okay, so with that, let's go to the next slide. So, so if my hypothesis is correct, then I think we will increasingly see a distinct line that will be drawn. It will be us versus them. And because of this, the global order will become increasingly unstable. And I think the chances of stumbling into conflict will increase. You know, it's the very uh, instability of the order which uh, can lead to, to conflict. And the reason why the word stumbling is important is I think Neither the United States nor China want the global conflict uh, because in the end, there are no true winners in such a conflict. But miscalculations uh, just, I mean, making, you know, wrong assumptions, you know, uh, for example, you know, not thinking that instigating something could lead to a big war, stuff like that. I, can't, I think we can uh, unwittingly fall into a conflict. We will also, I think, uh, see the United States perceive China uh, much more than an unfair player. During the 1980s, uh, when you had very severe U.S.-Japan disputes over trade, you know, uh, uh, the Americans painted Japan as being very unfair. Uh, but it never went into the realm of, of geopolitics. You know, Japan never threatened the United States uh, from a security perspective, but China does. And so in that case, I think traditionally the United States will begin to vilify China. China, you know, not just being unfair, but an evil power. And I think you, you will probably see much more of this rhetoric. 
Uh, and if decoupling proceeds, the trading blocks may very well emerge. Uh, as a, you know, as we recall, in the uh, during the Cold War, you had Chincom, which evolved to Cocom, and so I can see a strengthen of uh, a uh, multilateral export control regime, M you know, uh, MECR, uh, coming into play. And this could be perhaps a beefed up uh, Wazenar agreement. Uh, the current Wazenar agreement has no enfor enforcement rules. So I have in mind a Wazenar agreement with uh, enforcement rules in place. So um, again, this will further uh, promote decoupling because if you can't trade with China, you know, the Americans stomp their feet down and say, you know, trading with China, then what choice do you have? And so gradually, I think you will see an emergence of a 21st century tripartite pact. Um, of course, the Portuguese were very clever and, and did not uh, participate in this in the second global conflict. But um, I think uh, with the lines being drawn, you'll see China and Russia and Iran increasingly sort of coordinating together. Uh, already, the Chinese are coordinating with the Russians over Senkakus. Of course, these three countries do not see eye to eye on all issues. The Russians are not so happy of Chinese intent, for example, in, in the Arctic Circle. But yet, uh, they are unhappy with, with the current global order, with the United States at the center. And so, they would, they would most likely want to challenge this. And of course, you have other countries, such as Syria, Venezuela, and maybe uh, Cuba. I just throw that in there because the tripartite pact had Japan, Russia, and Italy, but not uh, Japan, Italy, and Germany, but it also had Hungary, uh, Hungary, Romania, and Croatia. So, I mean, I think you'll see these blocks emerging. Now, what are the geopolitical flashpoints? And I am a, a historian, so I'd like to give some historical analogies as well, too. The first global flashpoint is Hong Kong, but I guess it's not really a flashpoint because it's game over. And I feel sorry for uh, the people of Hong Kong who, who really want democracy, but I don't see any country intervening on behalf of Hong Kong. And so this is very much like Sudetenland. You know, uh, there's a good portion of people in Hong Kong who support China, who welcome Chinese dominance. Uh, and, you know, it's just that, you know, no country will be willing to uh, resort to, you know, a military solution to save Hong Kong. So it, it's over. Um, it's like the uh, South China Sea. Uh, the new norm, the status quo has changed and China has a, done a very good job of doing that. A senkaku, uh, I think if the Chinese do move in a hostile way towards senkakus, it will bring about strong economic reprisal, but I do not see the United States intervening militarily. You know, these are un uninhabited uh, rocks. Uh, and therefore, uh, it would be very hard to convince the American public uh, in, in promoting American uh, military intervention. But you'll most likely see freezing of assets and embargo. Again, this is very similar to when Japan uh, went into southern Indochina, present day southern uh, Vietnam. It brought about very strong American response. And so we could probably see this, which would include freezing of assets, embargoes, whatnot. Taiwan, this is the big one. And I believe, and there are of course scholars will disagree with me, but I believe this is a definite uh, casus belli. Um, you know, it's similar to the invasion of Poland. Uh, you know, Mer uh, once uh, Hitler uh, invaded Poland, uh, Germany and France were very quick to declare war. But I think the Polish analogy is also holds true in the fact that there are no US troops uh, in uh, Taiwan, uh, in Poland, there were no French or British troops. So even though they, they, they did declare war, they didn't really uh, mobilize to defend uh, Poland. And it sort of became what was known as the phony war. In the case of Taiwan, this is only true to a certain extent because from a military perspective, and I know there are many experts we're listening on who probably know much more about this than I do, um, but if you are going to strike Taiwan, uh, to annex Taiwan through military means, uh, Okinawa definitely gets in the way. And so I think it makes military sense to neutralize the American bases in Okinawa. Uh, it'd be very hard to go into Taiwan without doing that first. And, but Okinawa, if you strike 
American base is there, and that is definitely an act of war. Uh, so this is where the analogy is that there are, of course, very important differences. But I definitely think that Taiwan will be uh, the moment in which the United States will be forced to act. And of course, there's another uh, scenario that we can think of, and that is like the India. India is just one of numerous examples, like probably Vietnam could be one um, example too, but a local conflict spiraling out of control through miscalculation. Uh, this time, uh, what happened uh, in the um, line of actual control in northern India, it seems like uh, things got kind of bad, uh, but in the end, uh, so far, it has been controlled. But who knows? Uh, you know, World War I and World War II, I believe, devolved into a major conflict through miscalculation. Uh, Japan never thought that, um, you know, its southern advance would, would, would lead to a major war. Uh, neither did uh, Hitler when he invaded Poland. So uh, I think we need to also keep in mind of such scenarios. What I'd like to bring your attention to is the Chinese are recently taunting America um, because of the American response to the pandemic, which is really uh, America is still not out of the tunnel, so to speak. Uh, and this taunting of America, American weakness, you know, perceived American weakness, I think is very dangerous because I think it can um, lead to an underestimation of American resolve and American power. And this could subconsciously impact Chinese policy. And the Japanese did this with Americans. The Japanese perceived the Americans as being weak, uh, not willing to put up a fight. Uh, and, and this was a, a very, very incorrect assumption. So these are things that um, we can, uh, which worries me. Uh, and I hope that the Chinese are only saying this uh, on the surface and not really meaning it. But if they do mean it, and you know, this could, the Chinese government's uh, sort of, um, what they're saying about the United States could in fact uh, indirectly impact Chinese public opinion. And the Chinese public opinion they can perhaps push the Chinese government to act. So I think it's a very um, dangerous uh, situation. Now, historically, I also study American US history. I think the US always needs a reason to fight uh, in, in, in wars in which it does not really have legitimacy, it didn't win. The outcomes was not victory, a victory. So from that perspective, I think um, it will be three or above in which the United States uh, can be act and the nation will come as one. You know, it would be a legitimate reason for the United States to act. Now, <clears throat> finally, um, the Cold War. You know, I don't know about in, in, in Europe, but in Japan, the term new Cold War is thrown, out, thrown around very, very um, casually, which is kind of scary because I think the term Cold War is a very European or North American concept because in Asia, the Cold War was not very cold. You, know, you had the Korean War, you had the Vietnam War. And so we have to keep in mind when we use this term, new Cold War, there can, you know, there's a very good possibility of these regional conflicts. And these regional conflicts have a chance of spiraling out and, and becoming a major global conflict. And of course, the stakes will be much higher because we live in the world of nuclear weapons. Now, this is my final slide, and this is more for the Japanese audience, um, but uh, perhaps um, I could get your feedback from a European perspective. I call this the Reiwa restoration because you know Japan is now in the second year of the new emperor, Reiwa. Uh, and so what does Japan need to restore? I'll get to that at the very end. But in the near term, what does Japan need to do? Well, the big fad now is social distancing, right? Uh, because of COVID, I think what we need to do is nation distancing. And this will include also uh, member nations of the EU. We cannot rely on China. We need to reduce this, you know, our economic alliance. And we need to decouple of people and goods to counter Chinese leverage. One of the things you know, um, that really worries me is that um, even though I'm talking about the importance of decoupling, in actuality, the Chinese are decoupling much quicker. For example, if you look, take the latest Huawei phone compared to last year's model, um, the American components have, components have decreased drastically. And of course, Chinese components have increased. But interestingly enough, Chinese and South Korean, or Japanese and South Korean components have increased as well. So the Chinese are doing the strategic decoupling with the United States, but yet coupling even stronger with Japan 
and South Korea. So the Japanese need to keep this in mind. And I get a lot of pushback in Japan when I talk about this because they because you know decoupling with China is painful. But if you do not reduce your economic reliance or exposure to China, then they have leverage over you, and, and that is not good. And again, I bring out the concept of FIFA. China will use its market as a way to entice nations to see, to see, you know, seeking quick economic uh, rebound. And this, of course, would include countries like Portugal. Um, <clears throat> we need to ensure, or Japan needs to ensure that economic blocks do not emerge post-COVID. Uh, that's not good for anyone. So Japan needs to uh, actively support free trade. CTPP, it'd be nice to see um, other European countries besides the UK join CTPP. Best would, to see the United States rejoin, but I don't see that happening in the near uh, future. Uh, Japan in the EU uh, free trade uh, agreement uh, can be further enhanced. Uh, the UK FTA agreement, once UK leaves uh, the EU, uh, the most likely the United Kingdom will see benefit in joining economic with Japan. I'm not a big fan of RCEP, so in that regard, I appreciate India for her making things difficult. Uh, because, you know, RCEP, I think uh, China will be in the driver's seat, and that I think is bad news. So these free trade uh, arrangements in which China can be a member, but definitely not in the driver's seat, is something that I would support. Japan also needs to bolster its naval presence in the Senkakus, which will necessitate increase in defense spending. And Japan, of course, because of this pandemic, doesn't have much cash around, but this is something that it needs to invest. It's, you know, it's, it's safeguarding uh, your sovereignty. And therefore, in that regard, I think it was good that the Aegis Ashore program was canceled. You know, it's a money pit. You're throwing your money into a system that's expensive and maybe outdated by the time it's deployed. And so move that funds, that you know, money that you've saved and put it into stuff that you can use right now. I think Japan needs to link more closely with Europe and especially Britain and France, because these are the major maritime powers. Uh, they come out and they do fawn ops, uh, you know, in South China Sea. Uh, so I think it's very important that Japan uh, work with these uh, partner nations. And I think Japan should play an active role in the case that NATO is redefined, uh, rather than just being an observer. I think Japan needs to support a maritime ASEAN, uh, particularly. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, the, uh, I hate to say this, but I think there is no one EU. I mean, the EU exists, but within the EU, I think this pandemic showed that each country will pursue its own national interest first. You know, it's, it's my nation before the EU. And that's true for ASEAN too. Even though people in Southeast Asia like to profess this one ASEAN view, in reality, there, there, are, you know, there are different interests here. And the nations that have water uh, naturally see China uh, as, as a potential threat. And you know, landlocked countries or countries that do not really have a maritime presence uh, don't see China in such a manner. And so countries like uh, Vietnam and Indonesia, Indonesia because of its mass, um, I think, and Vietnamese because of its, you know, because it's, I mean, they're, they're gutsy people, you know, there are true fighters there. Um, I think it's very important that we, uh, we support these countries uh, and the Philippines, I think Philippines gradually are trying to they, they see the writing on the wall now and they realize that, uh, you know, entering into the Chinese orbit is not necessarily good uh, for their national interest in the long term, too. Um, so, you know, helping out these countries uh, is key for Japan, more active uh, uh, support. Something that I personally am promoting is a Japan ROK ROC, you know, Japan, Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, Triangle. After all, these are the three mature democracies in East Asia, and these countries need to work hand in hand. And this is difficult because if you're close with Taiwan, China's unhappy, Japan and ROK under the current Moon uh, presidency has lots of problems too. But, you know, in the end, I mean, it's, you know, bickering amongst these countries that have shared shared values only benefits China. And so I'm hoping that, um, uh, the leaders of these three countries, sorry for referring to Taiwan as a country, uh, but um, uh, I think uh, it's a de facto uh, country. Um, this, is, this is critically important, that these three nations uh, share information and whatnot. Also, Japan needs to def define FOIP free and open Indo-Pacific as a strategy. You know, FOIP is not FOIP, it's actually FOIPs. You know, the, the, the S is there. To, to, for strategy, right? 
uh, but the Japanese call it the concept because it doesn't want to aim it at uh, China. But we all know FOIP is there because of Chinese aggressions, uh, to counter Chinese aggressions. And if FOIP is the left hand, then I think right hand is quad. And we need to, uh, when I say we, it's that Japan needs to sharpen the effectiveness of the quad. We have to define quad. You know, and things are, I think, looking up for quad because Australia and India have stopped bickering over, you know, past uh, issues. And, and the quad is becoming much stronger. Um, I also like to remind you um, in, you know, the pre-war period in the 1930s, when Japan uh, was the challenger to the established order, uh, there was an, a you know, four power uh, grouping that came together. And this was called the ABCD encirclement, America, Britain, China, and Dutch, the Netherlands. You know, it's quite natural for uh, powers that, that, that share values or share a common threat to come together. And so I think we see this now uh, in 2020, this quad will perhaps become a much more formidable uh, a barrier to Chinese expansion. What's important for Japan, finally, is this is very critical, is that it ensures that US remains committed to the region. And Americans have the option always to withdraw to Guam, right? Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily need uh, to, to remain in South Korea, especially if the South Koreans don't appreciate the American presence there. Uh, and that happened in the 1950s with the Atchison Line. Again, um, if the Jap Japanese do not uh, do more in host nation support, that's the HNS there, um, you know, the Americans could you, you know, very well say, well, okay, um, if you're not gonna, you know, um, do your end of the bargain, then, then we're gonna have to sort of lessen our presence here. That could happen. Uh, so the nice thing, Japan needs to do more. It's not just about money, it's, it's to do more. And I, you see a lot more active US-Japan joint exercises, um, but I think the public needs to be more aware of what's happening so that they could support such maneuvers, such exercises. And one thing that I'd like to keep in mind is that um, I think there is a sort of, how should I say it? Um, I don't wanna say fallacy, but probably a misconception. And that is, seems to be that those in the military, in the United States and military and the Japanese military, because they work so closely with each other, have the sense that, that this partnership, this bond is unbreakable. But when you come down to the public level, when I, when, I, when I go to the United States and I speak, for example, I go down south to countryside, they have no idea, no concept of the United States-Japan alliance. That's true for Japan too. You know, average Joe here doesn't think about the US-Japan alliance. So in that regards, I think an alliance is only strong as, you know, as how the people perceive it. And this is an area that can be worked on. By the way, going back to the military, I mean, if you're in Okinawa, if you're a military serviceman in Okinawa, of course the US-Japan alliance is important. If you're in Hawaii, it's important. But if you go to the East Coast of the United States, or if you go to CENTCOM, if you're in the Middle East, the importance changes, right? So, I, but I think, there, you know, um, there's this concept though, because we sort of fail to realize that there are different perceptions toward the alliance itself. Now, finally, and this is my uh, final uh, spiel, and that is in the long-term Japan needs to revise Article 9. Japan under Abe uh, re has reinterpreted its national security laws, but this is very inadequate because it does not alter Japan's mindset. And by mindset, I mean Japan's security identity. Uh, and I hate to use this word because it's overly used, but you know, the concept of a normal power, Japan, I don't think really is a normal power when it comes to the realm of national security. And so how do you change your security identity as, as a people? And I think the only way to do that is, a, is the constitution because the constitution is what constitutes you. Uh, and, 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 and anything less than that, I think will fail to uh, uh, change the Japanese mindset. And so when I talk about the Reiwa restoration, that which I have up here, it's restoring Japan's security identity. And beyond that, which I haven't written down here, is that I believe that Japan should become a security provider. Since 1945 on, or you know, 1952 on, Japan has been a security receiver. 
and has received security from the United States, you know, uh, along with its own, but you know, the United States was a security provider. Well, Japan now needs to become the security provider in this region. I'm not saying that Japan should send troops to the Middle East. When it, when it comes to the surrounding area of Japan, Japan needs to be willing to help out. And this may, uh, a situation on the Korean Peninsula, the Koreans request it, the Japanese most definitely need the help, or in defending Taiwan. You know, this is again Japan's colonial legacy. You know, Taiwan's a democracy. Japan cannot stand idly by. It can't be about, you know, uh, providing cash. It's not about that. It's about, you know, really supporting Chinese uh, or Taiwanese democracy. But as we all know, the Japanese constitution uh, explicitly uh, forbids this. So if the world that I envision uh, of this increasing instability it, it is to be true, then I think Japan needs to effectively uh, respond to this or else, you know, it will uh, no longer become a relevant power in my mind. So with that, I've spoken for uh, about 38 minutes. I was given 40. I'd, def I'd like to hand it back to uh, Dr. Tomei and hopefully I can get your feedback, perhaps a European perspective from the audience uh, that, that have listened to my talk. Thank you very much. So Thank I hand you, back to Mike. Oh. Thank you, Professor Toshmi Noara, for this excellent and stimulating presentation. I please ask all participants to give a Zoom applause using the reactions button in the Zoom bar below. And we are now opening the Q&A period. And I ask all participants to open your videos to see us face to face and making the scenario more appealing than just pictures and names. To better organize ourselves, I please ask those who want to make a comment or question to do so using the little hand or the chat that are on the Zoom bar below so that I can pass the word. There is already Yolanda? Yes. Okay. Please make can your you, question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Okay. First, uh, what are the consequences for the European Union um, of the, this rivalry between the US and China? Yes. Second, what's the role of Russia in this rivalry? And regarding Japan specifically, uh, do you consider it possible for Japan to be drawn to the Chinese sphere of influence? Mm. Um, since the US has an erratic administration, you can consider <laughs> Trump erratic. Uh, um, that's an understatement. <laughs> has a lot of internal problems right now and it's isolating itself more and more from the the global order and even uh, stepping down from global leadership sure sure thank you so much yeah no thank you very much for the three questions may, may i answer this question sure yeah, please go ahead okay great, great. okay um yeah, um, well, you, you said about Donald Trump being erratic. I, I would say that, you know, he's erratic if you uh, compare him with, uh, you know, a, 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 the norms of what an American leader should be. But it's not erratic if you view it in the sense that Trump is pursuing his own personal interest, mm -hmm. not the interests of the nation, but his own interest. And if you see it that way, he, I think he's very, very predictable. I mean, the stuff that, I mean, I, I, I read Bolton's book. I mean, I parts of it that I got hold of. And to be honest with you, I mean, there's nothing surprising in there. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't prove it, but what, you know, I've been saying all along for the past three years that this is, this is what Trump is doing. You know, the fact that he came to Japan, that he's you know, trying to leverage Japan. I mean, I, I said that because to me, that's what Trump does. And then Bolton comes out saying that's what he did. So I'm like, okay, so I was right. But, you know, I'm not giving myself I'm not patting myself on the back because it's, it's very easy to sort of figure out what Trump's about. But your question about, and I'm going to go backwards um, because um, the point about Japan being sucked into the Chinese orbit is, I think, a, a, um, a possibility. Uh, and that is because, I mean, keep in mind that, uh, you know, before the Europeans felt the Chinese threat, the Japanese were saying, 
the Chinese are dangerous, right? And the Europeans are saying, no, 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 no. Especially the Germans are saying, no, nah, they're good for business, right? Now the Germans are saying, ah, oh, no, the Chinese are dangerous. And the Japanese are saying, oh, really? Right? So it's kind of funny because sort of the Europeans have sort of passed Japan. And the reason why I say this is because Japan, the Japanese government, the Abe leadership, was planning to invite Xi Jinping to Japan for a state visit. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what kind of message will this send? And the fact that the Chinese are, are you know, uh, sending their warships to, to Senkakus and flying into Japanese airspace and doing this and that, and, and yet Japan is going to invite Xi Jinping to Japan. I mean, oh my gosh, right? Talk about kowtowing, you know, ex, you know, accepting the Chinese order. Um, so yeah, that was a very likely possibility. But fortunately, you know, it's the positive aspects of the pandemic, right? That Japan's foreign policy had to stop. And, that, and in that stopping, it was able to reassess what was going on. And I think there was more clarity as to the way the world was heading. And it realized, oh, this was not the right course. So I'm really happy. But I think lately, because Japan is so dependent on China for its economic recovery, you know, and of course, you know, the economy always, you know, if you have a bad economy, that, that you know, you, that will lead to losses in elections. So I think, you know, like I said in my talk, that it's a tantalizing option. The Japanese um, leaders can think, okay, we need China to sort of, you know, restart our economy. And so let's link to China. Uh, so yes, yeah, that's very true. And there are, I'm not gonna name names, but there are several very senior LDP, uh, the ruling party uh, politicians who, who really want to go into the Chinese orbit. You know, they, they see that's the way, but you know, that, that can't be done because, and this goes to your first question about EU, because I believe the lines will be drawn, All right? And so, you know, EU will have to make decisions. You know, which, you know, it's going to be an us versus them. You know, it's going to be you know, good versus evil. And you know, which side will we be on? And I think not all EU countries will agree. Maybe countries like Hungary will say, oh, you know, we like China. They give us money. You know, they don't interfere in our domestic politics. So this could sort of, you know, lead to perhaps a, a, a sort of restructuring of EU itself. You know, I'm sure that in most EU, you know, I think, Diplomats in the EU will, will really, you know, cringe when they when they hear this. Thing, but that's a real possibility, and countries like Portugal uh, will have to make a decision. You know, um, I was just in Spain before the pandemic. This was November, and I was kind of surprised at how pro Chinese a lot of people in Spain were. And I don't know if this is the case in Portugal. I remember when I was visiting Dr. Tome back then. There, there were, I could sense a very strong pro Chinese. Uh, you know, uh, sentiment, but you know, things have changed, right? Uh, but Spain hasn't changed, at least did not change, it had not changed uh, in November. So I think there'll be tough decisions to play. And the Americans will uh, stomp their feet. They will force countries to, to, to choose a camp. Okay. And then finally about Russia. We should never underestimate Russia because they are a behemoth of a landmass. They are a formidable military power. Yet Russia has very, very strong weaknesses. Uh, discontent towards Putin is on the rise. Uh, but I always see Russians as, at least with the rise of China, uh, will act as the perennial spoilers. And they want to spoil the United States is what they want to do. So if the U.S. says this, Russians will say that, right? So, uh, and right now it makes sense for them to link up with um, China. And the Russians probably love it at this moment because all the heat is on China now with the so-called Kung Flu, you know, and the Russians aren't sensitive. You know, Crimea, people have forgotten about Crimea, right? It's no longer about Crimea. So I think right now it believes that this is an opportunity too. Uh, and Putin perhaps, you know, wants to be the next Tsar of Russia. So we have, you know, an emperor in China, we have a Tsar in Russia. Oh man, boy, we're living in crazy times. <laughs> but keep in mind, you know, I never, I didn't talk about this because I, I don't have the time to do so, but I feel in the end, you know, our side, the side of liberalism and democracy, rule of law will prevail. You know, I mean, we may appear weak in the beginning, but in the end we will prevail. I mean, what happens to Russia after Putin? What happens to China after Xi Jinping? When you consolidate power to that level, I think things can, can get kind of messy afterwards, right? So I think we need to play the long game here, you know, and so not go after short-term economic gain. 
But those were three excellent questions, by the way. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. But also, I, I, I want to question nothing but feedback about your perspective from Portugal, because you stand in a very different place from where I stand, because China is my neighbor, and your neighbor is, is Spain, right? <laughs> That's about it. And the Atlantic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I see no more people asking questions. Georgios Dimitriadis, please make your question. Hey, Deborah. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, good day to everybody. Um, uh, I would like to, to submit a question to Professor Minohara. It's fact that we shift uh, from a bipolar uh, model uh, to a tripartition system like uh, United States, Russia, and China, or let's say a multipolar environment that uh, different uh, minor forces uh, become reality. I would like uh, uh, to, to hear from you how Japan uh, diplomacy uh, evaluate the Sino-Indian conflict. Uh, or, okay. So Sino-India what? Sino-India conflict. Conflict. conflict, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's a good question, but it's also a tough one because the details are quite murky. Um, I have a, a source on the ground right there, and so I actually spoke to him on the phone just a couple of days ago of what was going on. And, and my assumption, well, he assured me that my assumptions were uh, quite correct. And my assumption was is that the Chinese are unhappy with what's going on with Indians, you know, Indians trying to change the status quo. And that is that air, air base. I don't know if it's an air base or an airfield. But and so the, to make it a more effective air base, the Indians are creating this road through that, right? Yeah. And the Chinese realize they can't allow a change in the status quo because the, that's what the Chinese excel at. The Chinese change the status quo in the South China Sea. So it's not going to let the Indians do this, right? And therefore, I believe that um, the conflict is about not allowing India the upper hand. And, you know, the thing is that when you speak to the Chinese and you speak to the Indians, and, and I have many you know, Indian friends, a few Chinese friends as well, too. Um, <laughs> I hate to say this, but the 1962 conflict, I think, has really traumatized India. You know, and I, I want to be, because being, being recorded, I want to be diplomatically uh, appropriate about this. But, you know, <laughs> you know, Indians are pretty tough when it comes to the Pakistanis, right? If the Pakistanis slap you, well, you hit them back really hard, right? That's it. But when the Chinese do it, it's a little bit different. And the Chinese are no pushovers, right? And, and they're definitely not Pakistani. So I think the Indians become more uh, cautious. Their response becomes more measured. But the Chinese know this. And they believe that in any conflict, that they're much stronger and much formidable. In the end, you know, the Indians won't be able to resist. I think these are the calculations. Uh, this plays in also to the two level again because a tough China looks good for Xi Jinping, right? So, I mean, and so I think well, the important thing is, is that both parties sort of contain this, make sure it doesn't spiral out of control. You know, uh, we don't want that, you know, that lone stray bullet to create some kind of travesty, right? So um, that's what I have in mind. But, you know, we, we need to see what happens. But, you know, again, it's it's not a, a symmetrical kind of warfare in my mind. You know, the, the Indians don't really have the, the armaments or the equipment on part of the Chinese. Because the prime Chinese have really revamped their military over the past decade, right? So I speak to Japanese fighter pilots, Japanese, you know, seamen, and they say, what has really changed? It's not, it's more than equipment. It's the fact that their abilities have improved dramatically. Now they know how to fly their, you know, fly their fighters. They know how to maneuver their submarines, right? So that's, that's important to keep in mind, I think, this, 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 this you know, uh, asymmetrical nature of the game. Thank you. Thank you. More questions, please? Deborah? Okay, please. Who, I, I don't know this lady. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. She's my, my former student. 
Yeah. Yes, Welcome. yes. My former PhD yeah. advisor. Oh, oh. Hello. Deborah, yeah, Deborah, before you say anything. Yes. I want to give me a 20 second commercial. Okay. So okay. I know any of you are students who are listening. Okay. And I'm always very open to having students come to study with me here in Japan. All right. Um, th there are many scholarships available. Uh, and, and Deborah was one of my brightest students. And she came from Portugal. I met her at a conference. I think I met her when Dr. Tomi invited me. Yeah. She was yes. an audience. Yes. Audience and Foundation. Yes, exactly. and, and she made her, she realized her dream. So if for those of you who are interested in studying uh, about Japan, if you come to Japan, you'll definitely see Europe from a different perspective. Uh, please let me know, okay? Uh, Dr. Tome has my email. So uh, yeah, please feel free to contact me. So that, that ends my commercial. <laughs> and, and, and Deborah, nice to meet you. Hello, I definitely recommend the MEX scholarship. It's a very good program. I was very happy to be a recipient of that program and I definitely recommend it. I would like to ask uh, Professor Minohara a question about the Chinese effort. So we've talked about their efforts in Europe, their efforts in Africa, their domestic efforts regarding foreign policy and public outreach, but are they um, well managed? Do, because you can throw money at things, but yeah. If they are not streamlined, if they are not connected, yeah. well connected, they ended up being fruitless. So uh, I, I wanted to ask you, are yeah. these efforts well uh, managed yeah. and well integrated? Yeah. That's, that's a good question. And, and, and spoken like a diplomat too, because <laughs> I, I would not have used the word efforts. Chinese efforts. I think these are Chinese aggressive interventions is what I would, I would say. It. Um, but yeah, I think that Chinese have not done a good job, you know, because when you go to Africa, I mean, initially, uh, people love Chinese infrastructure development and whatnot, but then they realize it's not about their country. It's not about uplifting these countries from poverty and, and helping them develop. It's, it's about China, right? When Chinese want to construct something, they bring in their own people, they bring in their own, you know, uh, firms. And so I guess, um, in, you know, initially, uh, people in Africa and other parts of Asia thought, okay, this is great. But but they now they see the truth and they don't like what they see. Okay, And this is probably more true in Africa than it is in, than it is in Asia. Um, I have friends in Africa and, and they tell me, you know, you know like for example, my Vaganian friend, he's like, oh, it's, you know, Ni hao is our language now. Okay, that's it, because we're just inundated with Chinese. But he says, you know, we don't really appreciate what they do because you know, nothing is lasting. You know, they, they make a bridge and the bridge collapses a month later, right? You know, so and by throwing money out, by throwing infrastructure project developments, I don't think you really buy hearts, you know, because the Chinese are doing that for their own personal gains, right? So I think there has to be a better approach. But in, in the end, I mean, do you share bias with China? Um, and I think for a lot of these People in Africa, uh, that's not the case, you know. But this is different when it comes to the leaders of Africa, right? Many of these leaders are uh, outright corrupt, you know, and, and, and they're out for the short buck, right? They don't care about their people. They want the money, and they don't care about the quality of the bridge. They want to show the bridge to their own people. Look what I did for you guys, right? Uh, so um, I think, again, there are differences uh, in that regard. But when it comes to the people, by and large, I believe that... Um, yeah, that, that they see the truth. And, and how, how's, that, how's that in Europe would be my question. How do the Europeans perceive that? I was in Poland in October, um, and it seemed like the Poles have started to see things from a different perspective. And when was it? And was it, was it November? I, I was in Riga, too, for a conference there. And I was surprised that the people of the Baltics were now seeing China as a big threat. You know, you think traditionally it's Russia. And so I said to them, isn't it Russia? And they're like, no, 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 no. It's not Russia, it's China. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I think views and opinions and perceptions are changing. And, and this will be, I think, a global thing. But of course, you will, will have a certain segment that will be grateful for Chinese help, Chinese assistance, right? And so again, it goes back to what I said, there will be a line that will be drawn. So thank you, Deborah, for the question. Thank if you, I can just... Then. Yeah, yeah, Deborah. If, I, if I can just say one thing, just regarding the European perspective uh, of Chinese um, uh, rise, but uh, 
right now we have a big debacle going on. I know people lost track of everything uh, that has been going on lately because of COVID, but right now there's a big debacle in, in Belgium, in Brussels, uh, with uh, um, the fact that apparently China bought or uh, bought the building for the Malta representation here. And it's right oh, next. Really? Yes, you should definitely Google it. Uh, and apparently it's believed that they have installed surveillance equipment uh, in the Malta rep, uh, um, building, which is right across the European institutions. Yeah. So that, that's definitely something we are now taking seriously. Uh, also in, in, yeah. in Portugal regarding the energy, uh, the energy sector, uh, I think it's something we are quite aware of as of late. I think probably Professor Luis Tomé with a strategy uh, is more equipped to, to talk about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't talk about 5G. That's another area in which I think even the Brits are reconsidering, right? Um, like, there's a backlash against Zoom too. You know, I, I like Zoom because it's easy to use, but I mean, there are, there are people who will refuse to speak to you on Zoom. Again, you know, security considerations. There's one thing that I did not mention in my talk, and that is when I talked about decoupling. Uh, one of the things is that one of the problems, areas in which China would have problems decoupling with the United States right in my mind, are semiconductors, especially semiconductor designs. If you have been following the news recently, you would, you would realize that SoftBank, which few years ago bought the UK uh, company um, Arm Holdings, which is the preeminent uh, company that designs uh, semiconductors and cell phones, he plans to sell a majority stake to China, to a Chinese company. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, now the Chinese, and, and, and Arm Holdings was, uh, was, is moving to also design semiconductors for computers. You know, this is Intel territory, right? So the Chinese are gonna get this technology, which will further allow China to decouple. So it, it's, I think it's, it's serious business and we need, we need to follow what's happening in the tech sector a lot more. And, and I bring that up because I didn't, I didn't talk about uh, 5G as much. This is, uh, this is a serious business. I um, mean, you know, we were snoozing, and therefore the Chinese have a dominance in 5G technology. You know, it's, it's the second tier of my, uh, my, my dominance paradigm there. Uh, so we need, to, we need to definitely take the upper hand in 6G. Oh, by the way, when I was in Krakow, the building in which I gave my talk, this is Krakow University, was also part of, was donated by the Confucius Institute, by the Chinese. It was a big statue of Confucius outside, and there I am in on the inside talking about the threat of China. So <laughs> I, was afraid, I was afraid that the building will collapse on top of me, but fortunately it did not. Okay. Yolanda is asking to make a small commentary regarding the relation EU-China. Okay. Yolanda, uh, briefly. Since, since you spoke about the European Union's perspective, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, during the financial crisis, uh, in 2008, yeah. Germany managed to avoid the, the negative consequences of the crisis by signing an uh, excellent um, treaty, commercial treaty, with China. Yeah. And most people don't <laughs> even know this, but uh, Germany has done it uh, again. Um, I, I think it was a month ago or... Oh, this I didn't know. Three, Please tell me more about this. Really? Uh, three, maybe three weeks ago, more or less than that, uh, Germany has managed to sign another huge deal with China in which China will assist Germany uh, or, in other words, will pull Germany out of a crisis in case uh, the German economy is very hard hit by the Corona crisis or the, the COVID-19 pandemic. True? Really? Really. It's not very well known, doesn't come that much in the news because everyone is obsessed with COVID-19 and how many people die, how many people are infected. Can you oh, okay. travel between okay. countries that's, that's, or not? But because the German diplomats that I meet, I mean, they're like, because, you know, the Chinese are buying out German companies, right? Yes. Uh, very they just bought KUKA. Yeah, two years yeah. Ago, they, they, all, KUKA. they always mention that. It's like, oh, my gosh, look, look what they bought underneath their noses. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 my assumption was the Germans had learned their lesson and were more wary. But you're telling me that's not the case. No. 
So that proves my point. I mean, China is capitalizing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the easy way out. Now, how about Portugal? Are you Portuguese? Are you Indian? Yes. Yes, I'm Portuguese. Are the, are the uh, Portuguese sign a similar deal? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but the Chinese do have a strong presence in Portugal. They yes. bought uh, a, a huge quota of our state energy company, EDP, and they are opening lots of uh, Confucius Institutes, including one here in Porto. I'm from Porto. Oh, Porto, nice place. Uh, it's still very small and it's not, it's not even a building. It's just a small room inside another university. Um, but they really have to, they really have a strong presence and often our government and our president do speak, does speak, do speak. They both do speak with Chinese uh, authorities. I have and, a wonderful response to that. And that is ouch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not but, that we are trying to move away from the American influence. It's just we are kind of stuck in between because yeah. uh, well, uh, the USA really helped us after you, our revolution. But yeah. we are um, all set with this US leadership and yes. the Trump administration. You're, you're so I have another question from Mattia yeah. Barbera. Yeah, sure, sure. So no, hold, hold on, Dr. Tomi, you're, you're saying that, that a lot of Europeans are sick of what's happening, right? With the American leadership, is that what you're saying? That they, you, we you are very them? upset with Trump's administration. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. Many, in many yeah. issues of international agenda, we are in the same side with China yeah. or Russia. Yeah. Not with the US, as usual. Like, like By the global. way, Japan as well. <laughs> China, in the many global, issues, right. is with, with China yeah. and Russia and not with the with US. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I totally agree. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, and I feel your pain and your disappointment with the current American leadership. But fortunately, you know, uh, Trump uh, will be gone eventually, if not yeah. you know, in the next election. <laughs> so. Four years for sure, right? I don't see him changing the U.S. Constitution. Um, so in that regards, you know, we know that this is not going to last forever. And most likely after Trump, the United States will return to normalcy, will mm -hmm. realize that he needs to be the leader of the free world, right? So I think yeah. it, it's temporary. We just, we just really need to really, um, to really uh, you know, uh, clench your teeth, you know, and, and grip our fists, just wait it out. Is I think what we need to do, um, but in the end, I'm I'm hoping that uh, that things will return uh, to a more a positive uh, state in the United States. Um, but you know, this election, I'm not I'm not really sure. People ask me, uh, who do you think is going to win? And, and I say I say you know, toss a coin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it may appear that uh, Biden is doing better now because of the pandemic and the Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement. But in the end, it's still uh, June, right? So who knows what's gonna happen? I mean, you know, this is, I'm almost scared saying this, but it can come down to if Trump really wants to win, he could think, okay, maybe if I start a major global conflict that the you know, American voters will vote for him, you know, because they don't want to change leadership, right? That could happen. You know, uh, and I, I would not put it beyond Trump to provoke China and to start a global conflict because it's so easy to provoke China, right? Just <laughs> support Taiwanese independence, right? I mean, that, it's, it's very easy. I, I totally agree with you. And I think this, this context of COVID-19, it's realized the, the challenge of China is so I think we are now more aware and more leaders are well aware that we need the concept, the new concept of democracy to face China. Yeah, and I, another, I agree. Better yeah. a network, including Japan, Australia, India, Europe, sure. US, and so on. Because yeah. China is a challenge at least, and I'm not mentioning a threat, but is a, a challenge for our liberal order. Yeah. yeah. You'll, you'll get no disagreement from me on that point. Yeah. No. Let me ask you the question from Mattia Barbera. 
Okay. He's asking, are peace and cooperation the long-term outcome of decoupling and less in the de interdependence or the opposite? Or are you assuming that containment will result in regime changing in China? Can you affirm that only China is responsible for the military escalation in East Asia? It is not also true that the US and its allies have increased their military presence around China significantly, at least in the last decade. <laughs> the provocative <laughs> question. <laughs> I give yeah. you that, huh? that one, I, well, you know, I think uh, countries in East Asia, notably Japan, also the United States, which has a military presence here, are responding to Chinese aggression, right? Because again, we have to keep in mind that the Chinese have changed the status quo. The South China Sea 10 years ago were just rocks that were barely above the water, right? And now they have, you know, airstrips there. So yeah, of course you have to react. But I would say that countries like Japan have not reacted quick enough, right? The military buildup, you can't compete with Chinese when it comes to the military buildup. Uh, Americans have a hard time because they're, you know, they fought a war in Iraq. They're trying to wind, they're trying to wind down one in Afghanistan. I mean, that, that zapped American power. I mean, I, you know, we, we've, Dr. Tom, we've all read McKinder, you know, and he says when, when you know, what, what, uh, what um, prompts powers to decline. And one of the things he says is that the wars, you know, Spain had its war with over the Dutch rebellion. This was not a total war, but it really sapped Spanish strength. The British had the Boer Wars, again, sapped British strength. Uh, and Americans, their wars in the Middle East. Are, are sapping American trade. It's not a knockout blow by any sense, but you know, little mosquito bites that, that sort of take away from you bit by bit. Um, also, McKinder talks about countries looking inwards. Of course, he was referring to uh, the Roman Empire, you know, when it started to have the Danube as one border, the Hadrian's Wall as the other, you know, started to not interact with, with other peoples. And, you know, Trump's wall, I mean, that's like, that's the 21st century Hadrian's Wall, right? You know, Japan, and America saying no to immigrants? Yeah, so in relative terms, yeah, I think America is, is making the wrong decisions, which will uh, weaken the uh, United States. Now, I believe that America is not beyond the point where, we, where it can't you know, remedy these, these mistakes uh, and take a different course. But when it comes to the military buildup, there's a lot more that can be done. Japan has to do a lot more too. Um, so, yeah, um, so I think it's very hard to, to defend China on, on those grounds. Um, now with, with the containment part, I, I didn't really understand the question. Um, so if containment will, what can if you- con Containment state? will result in regime change in China. It, the rapid change? Oh no, well, <laughs> so yeah. So we don't really see a Kennan-esque containment policy emerging, not quite yet. And uh, well, perhaps we will get there. Uh, and of course, if we apply, the like quad becomes the future uh, ABCD encirclement, then yeah, China, China will respond. I mean, the lines will be drawn even clearer. China will want to create its team, so to speak. So yeah, I think um, the world will become a lot more hostile in that regards. Uh, is, is containment, the best policy? Um, it, it may not be the best, but uh, it's, it's really hard to come up with a, a better solution. You know, um, I think that may be our only way, but how do you contain a country that is so, you know, such a huge economic presence mm -hmm. and also has technological prowess, right? I mean, they're very, very proud people. Now, if I were, Chinese, you know, if I had the little Communist Party membership card, I'd be here and I would talk to you for two hours of how great China is and at how Chinese actions can be justified, right? I could see it completely, I could see it from their, their perspective. But I just don't agree to their system. You know, I want to be able to, to live my life, you know, without being, you know, observed by cameras and whatnot. You know, I, I love and value my liberties. So even though I can see it from their perspective, I don't agree. And I think in the end, we need to resist. If the Chinese are gonna infringe upon my freedom, then yeah, that, that's cause for me to, to stand up. 
And to, if that means supporting containment, yeah, then so it is. Because I don't want them to, 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 you know, to spread their ideology and, and their and their way of life. So again, we have to make choices. We have to make, how, how important is democracy? To you? And keep in mind, you know, it's like it's like how security is perceived in Japan. I think we take democracy for granted. You know, it's like air. We think it's always there, and we don't make make, make any effort in maintaining it. But that's not the case. You know, democracy is very perfect. It, we need to always tweak it, make it better, and we need to we need to spend the effort to make it making it better. And I think uh, I think we sort of have taken that for granted because of the post Cold War world. I mean, it, we, you know, we didn't have to think about it. But now it will really force China's rise will force us to think what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want this, you know, Orwellian kind of state or no? We want something that's free. All right. So that's that's the choice, I think. So we have been talking on, on decoupling. So mm -hmm. I, I'd like to hear from you on reset. How do you see this Japan signature last year? The agreement establishing the regional comprehensive economic partnership, Our further side. extending the economic and commercial interdependence or dependence with China. This is not <laughs> decoupling. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, was this a symbolic form of political affirmation? Sure. In face of the protectionism against Trump administration and U.S. withdrawal from the, the TPP, yeah. or. Would that be been better for Japan to pull out of the reset agreement just as India? Yeah, that, that's one thing that, so I talked about RCEP and I told, and I, I said I, I wasn't a supporter of it. Um, but I also realized that um, many of my friends in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Tokyo think it's important and they support it. And they believe it's a way to, I mean, this is probably not the best word, but to, to restrain China, to make China a responsible stakeholder. But I've already heard that term, right? I mean, during Obama's administration, you know, China will act responsibly if it becomes a stakeholder. And it never did. And I'm thinking, I mean, does Japan have amnesia when it comes to stuff like this? Because Japan was a strong promoter of, of, of lifting sanctions on China after the Tiananmen Square massacre, right? Japan was a strong advocate and brought China into the WTO. And the world thought, okay, if China goes into the WTO, China will be back responsibly. It never happened. So I think we need to learn from our past mistakes. Just because we bring in China into RCEP doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, will lead to um, outcomes that we desire, right? Because China has its own agenda. And, what, and China wants to be in the driver's seat of RCEP and it will define RCEP, right? So, you know, um, it will sort of become a Frankenstein that nobody wanted. And that's why I like what India is doing. India is sort of like making it very hard, you know, and most likely it will pull out. And with India out, Japan will be like, okay, is this even worth pursuing? So great, you know, I tip my hat to India for doing that, you know, bringing the wrecking ball to this framework that I could not really support. Um, but on the other hand, Japan should support more free trade agreements with Europe. Europe is critically important for Japan. Um, you know, there are a lot of Chinese tourists flock to Japan, but you know, during the World Cup match last year, I mean, the Europeans spent a lot more, right? They spent a lot more, uh, like like five times more than the average Chinese. So if we have Europeans in, in quantity, I think you make up much, uh, you know, much of what uh, Japan will lack in Chinese tourists. Um, and in that regard, CTPP, I don't know what Portugal thinks about that. We know, I think we should change the name. It's not just Trans-Pacific, but I mean, CTPP, I mean, UK will join. Hopefully other countries will join. Um, I'm hoping that Taiwan will eventually join. I mean, this could be something, you know, this could prevent, uh, you know, unwanted trading blocks or protectionism from forming. And, and, and China is always welcome to join CTPP, right? Uh, of course, I say that in a tongue in cheek way. Yeah, because of state-owned enterprises, right? I mean, the, 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 it's a pretty high-quality free trade framework so that it will be very difficult for China to sort of overcome the stipulations, you know, because you can't have SOEs and whatnot, right? So, but because it's high-quality, and RCEP is not very high-quality, um, I think countries like uh, Portugal will definitely gain by uh, going into the CPP. 
but of course we want America to come back, right? That's the, that's the most important. Okay. There is one more comment from Georgios Dimitriadis. Please be busy because we are finishing the session. Okay, yes. What time are we finishing? Nine thirty. Uh, my In time. about four four minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. We don't want to abuse you because there are eight hour, hours more in Japan than in Lisbon. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's bedtime for me. <laughs> Nine nine thirty p.m. <laughs> yeah, um, please. I believe that uh, we are in a transition moment uh, from uh, an American way of life to a Chi Chinese lifestyle uh, as an imposition. Do you believe that uh, it's true my statement and uh, which could be the possible uh, social and political implications? Of, I would uh, like vehemently, you know, um, disagree with that statement. That I don't think we're moving from American way of life to a Chinese way of life. And I would also take issue with the term American way of life. It is not an American way of life. You know, the, the rule of law, democracy, liberalism, well, these are these are shared universal values in my mind. So it's not American way of life, it, it's our way of life. That includes you in Portugal, all the Europeans, you know, all democracies, I think. I mean, so, I mean America, American way of life, sorry, I mean uh, like, uh, um, the Western culture, and uh, of course, if you have a superpower like the uh, United States, I'm going to be a, a economical or political or well, military uh, um, presence in, in the world, also is a cultural, uh, it's, it's expression of, of, of a cultural uh, uh, power. So uh, maybe, my question is maybe that also I'm going to be uh, economical uh, conflict and uh, a commercial one with China. And uh, could be also a, a culture, a change of cultural model. Yeah, but then again, I, I, I would counter by saying that what kind of soft power does China have? I mean, who wants to emulate China? Who wants to become like China, right? I mean, I mean, there's nothing in that soft power um, realm that we, that we really uh, see China as you know, uh, a role model, right? That's what I would argue. I mean, and so when you look at other Asian countries like South Korea and I guess Japan, um, have soft power attractions, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so perhaps there is a shift from west to east, right? I sense that, especially among young Americans, because they know so much more about Japan than I do, you know, because on YouTube and, and they, know, they know a really abstract, notions in japan you know all that and they're, they're fans of really interesting things that which i never even given given any thought to so yeah in that sense yeah it's, it's if it's you're talking about this general shift where america is not solely at the center yes but i don't think the replacing will be done by china okay so in the end china will not succeed there will be no hegemonic shift there will be a hegemonic challenge and just like Japan, Germany, and Italy failed in its challenge, the Chinese will also ultimately fail. Okay, I'm keeping my fingers crossed too, but because I don't see the Chinese model of having any solid feet, you know? There's no one who really empathizes with that model. And the other things, I'm repeating myself, I mean, Xi Jinping has consolidated power to a level in which we have not seen, seen since Mao Zedong, right? And once, and if you look at Chinese history, when you have a strong leader, and once he's gone, things get very messy. And then you look at Chinese demographics, you know, it's aging very, very quickly. You know, it's just a lot of problems, a lot of problems. So I think, um, you know, it's like how I, I like this analogy. I, I say it's going to be like Star Wars, you know, things are going to get really, really bad. But the in the end, you know, the good good side wins. And I think it's going to be like, and so we just have to out, outlast China, right? Um, but th what I've been thinking is, you know, I think there could have been a different outcome from China. As for example, you know, if had Tiananmen Square succeeded and had China become a democracy, and I think, yeah, China could have been the alternate to the U.S., a new role model that we could, you know, follow, right? But that failed. And the Chinese model now, we, we don't like. 
So the lesson to be learned here is to my friends in Vietnam. You know, the Vietnam, you know, they're, they're good people. You know, they're, they're, they understand the Chinese threat more than anybody because they were occupied for a thousand years. But, you know, do we share values completely? No, they're, they're, they, no ideologically, they're more aligned with China, right? So I think for Vietnam, what's critical, for, if the line is gonna be drawn, it's really critical for the Vietnamese leader to think about the future of the country, not in decades, but you know, in centuries, and realize we need to make the transition to a democracy, a full-fledged democracy. And if we don't do it now, it's gonna get really, really tough. And, you know, the wealthier you get, the stronger you get, the more in entrenched uh, the stakes become, and you just don't change. You know, because you know, because it feels good to be you know that that leader in, you know, in your country, right? Uh, so I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned uh, for countries like Vietnam, and I definitely want Vietnam to be in my corner. That's a country I definitely want, you know. So yeah, but it's too bad. It's too bad it had to be this way for China, you know. And it, it it didn't have to be. But now, you know, I don't think China's gonna change for Xi Jinping is not gonna make China into a democracy. You know, we're not gonna see that. So we have to face the reality. And and we need to like, I think, stand up to this challenge we like. And it'd, it'd be good to have the Portuguese in my corner too, right? Because the Portuguese, you know, you guys had your day in the sun too, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tosh, on behalf of Autonomy oh, University no, of Lisbon and National Defense Institute once yeah. again. Thank you and please receive our best regards, our big applause, and thanks again. See you next opportunity. We know that it's too late in Japan and to all participants, I hope to see you soon at 3 p.m. Lisbon time. We have then another open class with Professor Rikal Freire on Russia's Asian policies. So Tosh, thank you again. Hope to see you and read you again and thank you for this great great session obrigado <laughs> arigato <laughs> appreciate the opportunity the pleasure was online thank okay. you bye, bye. Thank you all bye